Pastor Tony. Thank you for being here tonight. I want to tell you, this is a tremendous turnout, and it's indicative of the fact that God is doing something in your lives and in your churches, Great Commission-wise. When we get serious about the Great Commission, it's not because we wanted to do it, it's because God has put a passion and a fervor in our hearts to see the nations come to Him and worship Him. That's what the Great Commission is all about. And if we do have a, a fervor and a passion for missions, and I think we'll see two things take place in our churches. Number one, we have a lot of folks that hold a current U.S. passport, right? Because you can't go if you don't have a passport. So there will be a lot of folks that have a passport. And the second thing is there will be people who are learning other languages what John said in Revelation chapter 5. He said, around the throne, I saw people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Now, if we're going to teach the nations, that necessitates that we begin to speak their language, because they can't hear the gospel unless they hear it in their own language. So, I want to tell you, this is big boy stuff. The fact that you are here tonight ready to learn another language and to begin to train yourself to take the gospel cross-culturally to another people. Man, that's huge. Uh, that's something that I missed out on for most of my Christian life. It was one of the last pieces to come in, but boy, when it came in, it came in with a vengeance and just kind of consumed me. So thank you again for being here. Those of you uh, who have been ministering cross-culturally now for a time or you're just getting into it, You'll know what I'm talking about when I say there's just something about being on a cross-cultural mission field that heightens our spiritual awareness, that gives us the ability to encounter God, seems like more deeply and more intimately than we can in our own culture. And I've been a student of that phenomenon now for some time, trying to figure out all the aspects, and one day I'm going to... I'm going to put it all together, but here's one of the things that, that I think takes place. You know, Jesus said, unless you humble yourself and become as a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I want to say to you that you really experience that, do not experience that dimension of Christianity until you are out of your world and out of your comfort zone. I mean, stop and think about it. Here, we're all established adults, uh, grounded in our faith, uh, mature in our profession, and we got it under control. But now all of a sudden, God invades your world, and he tells you that it's time for you to take the gospel cross-culturally into another language, into another nation. And guess what? It doesn't matter what you are here because when you get there, it doesn't matter. You can be an astrophysicist here. And when you get over there, if you can't talk, you're nothing. So you really become a child again. And you have to learn, just like children do at, when they're toddling, you've got to learn how to communicate. You've got to learn how to talk. You've got to learn how to relate and how to respond to your environment and react to the world that surrounds you as a child because you are literally in a new world. You see, that's what cross-cultural missions is about. Unless you humble yourself and become as a little child and maybe when we're there because we are so childlike, maybe that's one of the dimensions, the spiritual dimensions that gives us that added closeness or another level of intimacy with the Lord because here, you know, we can we just put it on autopilot and go in the back and fix us something to drink while the plane's flying itself. But you can't do that over there. So I want to say tonight, welcome to kindergarten. <laughs> you're going to think that you're starting all over again, and, and, and you really are. Because when you're learning a new language, you got to start right where you started when you were four and five years old. you got to start with the ABCs. Because what we have to do is we've got to deprogram our mind and our mentality from everything that life has put in you from birth up until right now. There's got to come a time when you flip a switch and you turn that off because nothing applies anymore. And you've got to reboot in another culture and in another tongue. And that's what we're going to start doing tonight. We're going to start the process of 
deprogramming you and rebooting you again in the world of Brazil and in the tongue of Portuguese. Now, this is going to be a process, you understand. Now, Heather and I have been working in this language and in this culture for about 10 years, and, and I want you to know there's still times when I'm just completely stumped, just stumped. There are other days when I'm riding high, man, I feel like there ain't nothing you can throw at me that, you, that I can't get. And then the next day God humbles me and puts me back in kindergarten. It seems like nothing is fitting in anywhere. So it's a process. But I want you to also know that if my presence here tonight doing this means anything at all to you, it ought to say to you that I can do this. Because if that old dumb redneck can do it, I can do it. And you see, we didn't, we didn't have, Heather and I did not have the benefit of, of two or three years of formal language school. Uh, we never have taken a college Portuguese class. God has resourced us. And the same way he resourced us, he'll resource you. I started with my buddy Malthus. How many of you met Malthus? Malthus came to the States after my first trip to Brazil and spent about four weeks with me. And every morning in my office while I was pastor at First Baptist Hilliard, me and Malthus would get there early before anybody else, and we'd have about an hour and a half, two hours of Portuguese. And he's a stickler, conjugating verbs, building vocabulary, making the sounds right. And from there, you know, God just continued to bring Portuguese teachers into our path, as he will you. And next thing you know, you're going to be standing up one day preaching and speaking and giving your testimony in Portuguese. That's just the way it works. So it is a process. And I want to tell you, there's going to come times when you want to quit. There's something about language learning that your mind's going to get to the point where it's saturated. And you're going to say, I can't take another verb. My tongue will not make another contorted foreign sound. And you're going to want to just die. And you're going to put it down. You're going to go to bed. You're going to sleep. And a couple of days, all that's going to click. That's just the way it happens. It takes your mind a couple of days to catch up to you. And then you're taking another step and another step. And that's just the way it works. So don't get discouraged this weekend. I want to give you a broad platform from which you can build on on your own. Uh, after we conclude this thing tomorrow evening, you ought to, uh, or tomorrow afternoon, you ought to have enough tools and enough of the basic foundation that, that you can then resource yourself or God will resource you and you'll be able to go in whatever direction and to whatever level of language proficiency that you would like to attain. You know, I just have to tell you right up front, I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd when it comes to language. I, I, you know, that's, that's my thing. I just love it. Uh, if I would have known this about myself when I started the educational process, I would have went uh, overboard probably in linguistics because that's just what floats my boat. But again, I'm kind of the, the Sheldon Cooper of linguistics. You know, that's what, what does it for me. It doesn't do it for everybody, but nonetheless, uh, again, you can pick this stuff up. And I'm going to give it to you uh, this weekend from, from things that, that we have learned that nobody taught us. There's a lot of simple stuff out there that we've been able to put together that None of our teachers told us. I think teachers are like that. They don't want to tell you how to make it easy. You know, They want to make it hard for you so you'll appreciate when you get it. But we're going to put a lot of stuff in place for you that I think will help you. Because I, I approach language learning from a, linguistic, uh, from a linguistic approach, for example. Especially these, uh, these languages, these Romance languages like Portuguese and Spanish. This is, what the, this is basically how they flow. You know, they, they all are derived from a Latin root. And uh, what will come up here as uh, Spanish. Another one will flourish as English. And another one in that family will be Portuguese. And once you have something to hook all of these together, it really helps you see that, you know, this is not just insanity. It's not just random. But it really does flow and we can make the connections, not so much, well, you'll be able to see the Latin roots, and we'll point out some of those to you as we're building our vocabulary, but you'll be able to see the relationship between them because they all are uh, cousins linguistically. And that's one of the approaches we're going to take. Another approach we're going to take, not only the linguistic uh, platform, but phonetically. Phonetically. We are going to learn how to say 
vowels, how to say consonants, because they don't make the same sound. See, that's why you got deprogram and reboot. You got to get your mind to knowing what A makes, and it don't necessarily make the sound we think it makes here, or it makes here. And same way with the letter I, make a completely different sound. But there's more consistency in Portuguese than there is English, so you got good news. You know, English and English speakers, I <coughs> find that, that we are very lazy speakers. And when I mean lazy, I mean we do not really enunciate real clearly. And we'll talk sometimes with our mouth, you know, kind of closed, we won't even call it move our lips, like we're ventriloquists. Well, Portuguese, you can't do that. Portuguese, you've got to be expressive. Uh, I, I think everything in the Brazilian culture is like that. It's expressive. And language fits that pattern. So we are going to literally speak all over ourselves. We're going to open our mouths and we're going to make those sounds because if we don't enunciate, we won't get it. My language, uh, Maltus used to tell me all the time, open your mouth when you are talking. And he's right. If we'll open our mouth, we'll be all right. Another thing about English is that, see, we, uh, you've got a lot of advantages in Portuguese that we don't have in English, which you, you're going to take advantage of. A lot of our vowels make the same sound. Let me, uh, let me illustrate it to you. The word confer. Give you another one. The word confirm. Basically, no difference. Confer, confirm, but you got an E and you got an I. Let's just say this word, fur. No difference. A Brazilian would be pulling his hair out right now saying, How do you spell those? How do you know to spell them? Because they all sound the same. Let's go, let's put one more up here just for fun. Worm. Now we got an O-R, we got an E-R, an I-R, and a U-R. And if we didn't know any better, we'd think it was one letter making the same sound. You see, you would never have that scenario in Portuguese because all of these letters will always make their unique and particular sound. So we've got some, uh, some things working in our advantage for us in Portuguese that we don't have in English. Now, I want to show you something on, on, over here on my computer that we are going to learn uh, today and tomorrow. And I want you to just hear it. And I want you to look at the words, see if you can pick out any of them because we're going to use this particular song that we do not have in English as kind of a basis for some uh, vocabulary building. Because that's one of the things I will do. I, I want to give you stuff that when you go to Brazil next time, you can say, ah, I got it. And you can, you can sing their songs. You can know what they are saying. And we're going to begin to, uh, to learn that. You know, again, welcome to kindergarten. Some of the things that you learned in kindergarten, how did you learn them? Through music sing it. And a lot of times when I'm conjugating a verb, I can be preaching. And I know there's a verb coming up. And guess, I'll, I'll put that paradigm chart in my mind and be trying to grab it from somewhere. And if I'm still in doubt, a music lyric will pop in my head. And that's the, that's <laughs> the one I needed to give me confidence so, uh, that I did grab the right verb. So we'll learn, we're going to use music to do a little language learning as well. Let me see if I can get this to come up. This is uh, one of my favorite Portuguese songs. We'll get the words to it uh, uh, this week in before we get done here. It's called Chilo Vade. Listen to it. They do have that in They do. They have it in It's called Draw Me Close. Okay. Draw Me Close, yeah. All right. Check out the words. Eu 
infant or neuter. If it was a female cat, it would be a gata. For instance, in Brazil, the boys say about the hot chicks, they are gatas. <laughs> hot chicks, yeah, some slang. All right, next vowel, A, E. Except in Portuguese, it's not pronounced E, it's pronounced E, E. So we have A and we have E. Now let's see what would be a good word. Let me let me give you this word right here for e. D e d o. Dedo, which means finger or toe. No distinction between the digits. Dedo. And it will always make that sound. E e e. Now this is where it gets tricky for our American minds. Is that word always masculine? Yes, it is. Song? This one is always, always masculine. Yes. Next, next one in the progression as they come, come through the alphabet, we would call this I, but in, let me see if I can do this phonetically for you. E H E. Uh, yeah, ah, ah. Now, this one is always going to be the long E sound, E. So when someone in Brazil is writing something for you and they say I, E, that means A, I. Again, it's a little bit tricky because that's not the way we've learned it. Let me give you a word for you to practice. This one has all three of our vowels that we've already learned. Exactly. And you say that, igreja. Igreja. And that is church. Next vowel in the sequence is O. Um, in Portuguese, they pronounce it all, all. Now, I don't know how to do that phonetically. It's almost, A -W. well, yeah, E-W-A-U, all uh, is kind of the way they do it. It wouldn't be O-H to fit the pattern. It's kind of all. Now, it holds that pattern when it's in the middle of a word. For instance, uh, here is a word for you. G-O-T-A, and you say that, gota, gota, that means a drop, for instance, a drop of water, gota. Now, the exception is, is if we have the O coming at the end of a word. If the O is at the end of the word, it kind of breaks from the pattern and it will give us a U sound. Did you notice when I pronounced finger or toe? I said, I didn't say dead doll, dedu, dedu. Kind of makes a U sound when it's on the end. Dedu. Exactly. All right. Final vowel is U. And in Portuguese, it always makes ooh, ooh, ooh. Never will we pronounce you, you, as we do uh, in English. But it's ooh. Uh, let me think what my paradigm word is. What? Yeah. No, no. Uh, give me one, Ned. For you. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. We could use that one if we could use this one. Fruto. Fruto. And that is the word for fruit. It will always. Uh, let me see if there's one where we have a tendency to do you, make the you sound. Anyway, kudurupu. <laughs> Man, look how many that has. Kudurupu. <laughs> uh, yeah, 
uh, the verb, the verb for use. How would you say that? Uza. That's right. Uza. See, see, we would say it use, but for them, uza, uza. All right. Let's practice opening our mouths and talking all over our face. The letter A makes what sound? Ah. Uh. Uh. What's our paradigm word? Got uh. to. Got to. Very good. Next vowel is E. Uh. What sound does it make? E. Uh. Paradigm verb? Uh. Our word? Dedu. Uh. Dedu. Okay. Next vowel is E. E. And our word is? E. Igreja. Very good. Next letter? All. Oh. All. Oh. Oh. Exactly. All. Oh. And our word is? Galta. Galta. And then? Ooh. 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 Our word? Fruto or? Uza. Very good. All right. You've got the vowel. If you can master the vowel, you can make the sounds because that's pretty much where the sound comes from. Now, from there, let's go on and grab a few, of the, few more consonants because some of the consonants do some tricky things as it compares to English. Again, it's just a process of retraining your mind for these vowels to make different sounds. So, first we have a, ah. next we have, how would you say that in Portuguese? Anybody want to take a stab? Bet, you got it. Bet. B E H, probably phonetically. The next letter is set. Exactly. Now, the letter C has two functions. It will either take on a uh, a hard C, uh, like it would make the K sound. For instance, uh, the word cotton. Cotton. Almost a, a K. But it only makes the K sound when it is followed by A or O. If it is followed by E or I, all right, let me put U up there too. Because U, it'll, it'll do the same thing. Let me give you a word with C U. Here was my word I was trying to pull out a little while ago with U. We would say cube. Come on. Kubu. Yeah, remember, masculine, cool. So right, and you see that's hard. Anytime it's followed by a U, by an A, and over a U, we get the hard C, the K sound. If it's followed by an E or an I, what do we get? S sound. That's exactly right. We get the S sound. Uh, for instance, uh, C I D A G E, C D A G, city. And that's the, there's your, your S sound. Now, there's another unique facet to the C, and it's called the C Sadia. Here's where we're getting into all those little foreign marks that we don't have in English. C Sadia. It's just that little squiggly line under the C. Remember we said when the when the uh, when the C is followed by an by an A? by an O or a U is a hard C sound, unless it has the C sedilla under it. That makes it, wherever it is, that makes it an S sound. For instance, uh, Acai does it. Yeah, let me give you one with two of them. Uh, C, A, B, E, C sedilla, A. Somebody will take a stab at it? Cabeza. Cabeza. Exactly. Cabeza. And you know what that is? Head. <laughs> Head. You will see a lot of this probably from your interaction with Latin uh, in, your, in your studies. Uh, of course, Latin would be, uh, uh, would it be cephalus in, in Latin? So it has some of the some of the root, but still it's gone. But you'll you'll notice some things coming together. See, I right, the next one is de, de. We just take off the e basically of everything, and you're okay. A B C D E. 
All right? Except in Portuguese, it's eh. Eh. Next is they pronounce F, Effie. 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 Um, basically, the F takes care of everything. Uh, you know, we have telephone, P, H. Well, in Portuguese, it's not. It's T, E, L, E, F, O, N, E. So it takes care of all those F sounds, Effie. A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Sometimes, and it's just J. J. Yeah. Uh, and it'll, it'll take on two, two, uh, two functions as well. Do you remember the word? Gotha, for drop of water. But if we have an E after it, Again, geographia, geographia. So it can, uh, it can take on that J sound. G E L G H I. Here's a here's a here's a tricky one in Portuguese. They they can't do Heather's name because of this. This is aga, aga, and I don't know how to tell you it, phonetically. A H, yeah, I thought there was an A H G A A H, yeah. I got phonetically. And if it's up on the front of the word, for instance, uh, yeah, there is a girl in our home church in Kudarupu. What's that name in English? Helen. Helen. In Portuguese, H doesn't exist. It's just there for looks. Ellie. Ellie is the way they would say it. They would kind of accent the E because the H there. You know, the, the, the H does that in English as well. I mean, stop and think. There's a lot of English words where that H is just there for looks. Honest. So it's really not that foreign of a concept. Um, okay, C, E, F, G, H. Here we go. There's our, our, our vowel E. And then we come to J, which is Jota. Jota, they will call it. Jota. And it does the same function as it does in English. Next is Ka. And they would probably, probably do it something like that phonetically. Ka. Nothing tricky about the letter K or Ka. Next is, and they say it, Ellie. Ellie. Uh, probably just like in Portuguese, that is the personal pronoun for he. It is the third person singular masculine pronoun. They, they pronounce the, the letter the same way, Ellie. Then we have. Amy, Amy, nothing tricky. Amy, all, pet. Help me with that one, Heather. Yes, it is. It's, it's cat. Cat. Not like cop, but cat. Uh, I would say, I would say, uh, there's a word in Portuguese that, that means that, and it's spelled, it, it's, it don't have the H on it, but phonetically it would be spelled cat. Yes, cat. Well, it, it's just, you know how it is. Q always takes the U with it. Always takes. Uh, Okay, R now is going to give us a little bit of a little bit of curveball. Hi, Mundo. Yeah, you remember H doesn't serve a purpose up at the front of the word, but you put it put an R up at the front, and all of a sudden that R becomes a strong H sound. Uh, for example, uh, my name uh, would not be. Yeah, 
That's right, that's right. Appendix has to be Or, yeah, hand, yeah, if they see it written, that's what they would do. They would say handy. Uh-huh. Uh, by the way, the D, since we brought that in, let's, let's look at that D real quick. Sometimes the D will give us the hard D, dead. If in other situations, what is that? Gia. It'll give you kind of the J sound when it's got a, an, an E or an E after it. Now, there was another, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Let me, let me back up here also and grab, you, grab M for you because M will do some strange things on the end of a word. For example, you guys know this phrase well. Do the bang. Now in English we would want to say to the bang. But it's not. A final M will always take the N sound. Do the bang. Same way with the formal word for yes, spelled S S E E Amy. How would you pronounce it? Sing. Exactly. It takes on an N. Now, when you plural this, when you make this plural, it does, it, it, it really comes into play. Uh, for instance, uh, this is everything is well. Everything is well. This is the word for well. Uh, but it can also be the word, word for things that we have, our earthly goods. They would call it bane. It would be plural, and then it does N-S, Baines. For example, the word message. Brother Randy is going to bring a message. Mensaging, mensaging. That final M turns to an N. But if he's preaching two times, Eli vai traze do us mensagings, then it's going to morph a little bit and it's going to take on the plural form, which is in S. Just some things that, a uh, little twist that some of the letters throw at us every now and then. Now, and then. now let's get back to R. R does. Up front, it is going to be, for instance, this word right here for rich. How would you say it? Hiku. Hiku. Say it again. Hiku. 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 Yeah, it kind of puts your accent up front. Hiku. Hiku. Exactly right. You got to train your mind to go back and grab that. Now, if you have an R uh, that is kind of the first consonant in a word, for instance, uh, this is a word that means hard, and you pronounce it duru, duru. Then your R becomes a very soft D. Duru, duru. Not a rolling like it does in Spanish, just a very soft, light D. Like putting your tongue to the top of your palate, duru. That's all you do with it. And it's different from this D, because that's harder. Doodle. See the difference in that? This one is harder, this one is, is soft. Now another thing that the R does, if the R doubles, for instance, the word, Heather gets on to me, she says there's no distinction in my small C's and small E's. And I think she's right because in one of our training sites, they asked me to write my name one day and I wrote it and I gave it to them on a piece of paper and they came back the next day with monogram, monogram towels for us. And it was spelled R-I-C-H-I-C. -I -I so I guess she's right. Now, back to our lesson. If we double this R in the middle of a word, what's it going to do? It's going it's to turn to an H. It's going to turn to an H again. Cotton. Cotton. And what is that word? You got it. Car. So, we've got a hard C up here because it follows, or it is followed by an A. We got double R, so they're going to turn into an H. And then we've got a final R, and it's going to turn into a U. 
So, Cotton. Those two R's turn into one H? An H, one, one H. H. That's right. They'll make the hard H sound. Exactly right. Okay. Well, that makes perfect sense. It does, don't it? <laughs> can we, instead of starting in kindergarten, can I just start in nursery? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Nap time. Yeah, we'll go to PlayStations in just a minute. Essie is uh is S and it's straightforward. Thank God for straightforward letters, right? Essie. Te. And it's gonna be straightforward. It's gonna give us a good old southern T sound. No matter where we find it. Next in line is our friend who? And then we come to the V, which is V, 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 E, H, probably phonetically. Hmm. W. W. W is one of the hard, it's, it's almost non existent in the Hebrew alphabet, Hebrew language, uh, excuse me, Hebrew, uh, Portuguese language. Oh, no, we've already changed language. <laughs> Portuguese language. <laughs> <laughs> it is a hard one for them to say. When they are given web addresses, even if you hear a commercial on TV where they're given a web address, it sounds so awkward, don't it? Dabble, dabble, dabble. Yeah. We've got a guy in our church. You would think he has, or had a guy in our church. You'd think he had the easiest name in the world for Brazilians to learn. His name is... W-A. W -A. And they can't say W-A to save their life. Just forget it, because that W, like I say, it's, it's almost non-existent. I don't, I don't even know the word. I can't give you a word, vocabulary word that even has it. Uh, U-V-W-X. X is chase. I don't know. Uh, it makes us chase. Something like that. The S-H, uh, phonetically. Chase. Uh, when when you see, you know, a lot of the technical words, uh, they'll bring right in. They'll spell them the same. Sometimes they say them, say them the same. All technology stuff. It's funny to hear them uh, call a mouse a mouse because that's, you know, it's not a Portuguese word. Uh, Xerox, Xerox, they will call it Xerox. Xerox. You hear that? That chase? Xerox. Is that turning that R to an H? Uh, no, they turned that R into a slight D. Shedox. Shedox. Uh-huh. X, uh, Y is uh, Epsilon, just like in Greek. Epsilon. And then Z. And it is rare you find a Z and the Portuguese language as well. For instance, people ask me all the time, why is it written like this there and like this here? Because that is another, another function of the S. It will do the Z sound. So Brazil, they will say it as if it's a Z, but it's an S making the Z sound. I, it's a rare day you'll find, you'll find the W and you'll find the Z. So the alphabet comes down to about 24 letters for us. So it's easy, right? Yes, ma'am. How would you say work? How would you say what? Work. Like work. O R K. Price job. <laughs> say it again. <laughs> <laughs> say, say work. Work. W O R K. In Portuguese, trabalho. <laughs> trabalho. Which brings us, thank you for that segue, because that takes us right into where we were going next. I saw somebody with a hand. Well, like. One of our translators, Winslow. Winslow. Not Brazilian. Is he just. I mean, is that his Brazilian name? That is. How would they say it? That is. Just like you did, Winston. That's well, a good example of the W. w. Yeah. That's a good they example. They can't say W-A, but they can say Winston. Yeah, they can't say the, <laughs> the letter's name, but they can make the sound with it. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. They just can't say W. That's right. They can't say W. Uh, now. Again, thank you for the segue, because here we go, uh, from our alphabet, we go to diphthongs. Now, some diphthongs is where it's going to get interesting up in here. 
because they will make some sounds with their Portuguese tongues that our American mouths just don't want to make. So let's get at a few of them uh, real quick. And this is where I'm, there, so I'm sorry? How many diphthongs are there? Lordy, I don't know. More than three. Huh? Yeah. Three, four, five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and the thing with them is, let's start first with, I don't know if you call them a diphthong, but they're, they're combinations of consonants that we don't have in English. For instance, N, H, A, N, H, E, N, H, O, N, H, I, forgot I, N, H, U. Now, this is where we kind of go three stooges on you because uh, we don't, we don't want to do this. But to pronounce this, and this is common, you're going to run into it everywhere. This is nya, nya, nya. You've got to get it nasally. You just got to come out your nose. Yeah, see, see, that's why I said three. That's what it is. Yeah. So we got, we got nya. We got nyen, we got nye, we got nyo, and we got new. Alright? That's where the three students just got. Alright, so you go with me now. What do we have here? Nya. Nye. Nyo. You got it. Now, if that wasn't complicated enough, L H A L H A. E, L, H, I, L, H, O, L, H, U. E, ye. I mean, you got to get way back in your palate. E, ye. <laughs> Here we go. Ya, ye, ye, ya, you. It's like you biting the back of your tongue. You're trying to swallow the back of your tongue. All right, here we go. Let's take it from the top. Ya, ye, yo. No, ye, y'all, you. Do it again without me. Ya, ye, ye, yo, you. These are tough ones. I've got some friends that are always on me about my pronunciation of several words. Here's one right here. Now remember, we got a final H, a, a final R, so a final R is one of those nuances that I failed to give you. It's going to turn again into kind of an H sound. This word is pronounced melio. Melio. Yep, melio. Now again, I'm giving you the northeastern Montagnau pronunciation. If it was in San Paul, we might have a derivation. But in Montagnau, melio. And you know what that is the word for? Better. Better. Exactly right. All right, let me give you another one. Mul. They're always told me about how I say this word. Mouye. Mouye. Say it with me. Mouye. I mean, you got to hit everything all the way from that little hangy down thing in the back of your throat <laughs> all the way out to the front of your palate. Mouye. Got it. Yeah. You, if, I, if they were here, they'd laugh at me. But this is a tough one. This one is the word for woman. Exactly right. Woman. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to, say, trying to get you some vocabulary over here so you can pronounce that. Uh, what did you say? We can use that one. Just as. I didn't get your T. Put a nuance on your T. It's your alphabet. I said a lot of times, most of the time it does T, but it will do when it's followed by an E or an E, it'll be your CH. Chi. Chi check. Chi check. All right? So this word is the word chinya. Chinya. Say it with me. Chinya. Chinya. It's a it's a past tense uh, verb for had. El Chinya, yesterday. I had in the past. Okay? Now let's get a few more of these. Uh, 
of these vile diphthongs. What's T-I? Just T-I. T-I? G. U. U. That's yes. Yes. There are several ways they, they write you, Tony. Uh, sometimes it's depending if it's subjective, objective, where it is in the sentence. Sometimes you'll see you this way, sometimes you'll see it that way, sometimes you'll see it this, this way. Do. Do cheats. Yeah. So it just depends on where it is in the sentence and what function it's, it's serving in the, in the grammar structure. But any of those, if they're standalone, uh, we would translate that as you. Okay, now some vile diphthongs. Vile diphthongs. Let's start with... Uh, you know, I just want to give you the ones that uh, we're not going to run through every combination because some of them are, are, are pretty uh, commonsensical. So let me give you the ones that, that may give you some trouble. Uh, E-U. E-U is a pretty common diphthong. And it said L. 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 It is also the first person singular pronoun for I. So it's L, L, L. And it's going to make that sound no matter where it appears in a word, in the middle or on the end. So there is L. Spell it out, what you're saying, because it sounds like you're throwing an L sound. It's all no, you are coming right up to pronouncing an L and L stopping short of it. That's right. Well, yeah, phonetically, it would it would be uh, like a baby maybe so, Bill. Uh, L or something like that, or just a yeah, something ails you. Yes, there you go, L. I mean, you're just stopping short of pronouncing the L uh, on the end of it. L. L. That we're, we'll use that in our verb paradigms, so you will have that one, I promise you. Uh, you'll have that one ingrained in your memory, uh, written on the inside of your eyelids before we're done here, because it's uh, it'll have a prominent place in our verb paradigms. Uh, other diphthongs. See, the other ones are, are pretty standard. You'll have an O-I. Same as we have it, it would, it would be oi. Oh, matter of fact, they use that, oi. What does that mean? Hello. Hi. Yes, it's kind of an informal. Oi. Uh, A-I is going to make I. For instance, if uh, we put a V on the front of it and said in front of it, como vai? Yeah. How are you? Or literally, how is it going? Uh, it's a verb for to go. Uh, we'll conjugate that one. Uh, and as far as I know, we're going to be, yeah, I did D-I-G. We went back and got it. You must have been sleeping. We went back and I missed it the first go, but I came back and got it. So that is basically your diphthongs. The rest of them, if there's a strange one that comes out, we'll let you know. The main, the main combination of those consonants and that nya, 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 and all that type of stuff. And, oh, wait a minute. There is another one I've got to give you. Uh, because there, there are some accent marks in Portuguese that come into play pretty significant. For instance, one combination of letters is A with a squiggly line over it. That squiggly line is the accent mark called a chia, a chiu, 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 chiu. And that makes this, this diphthong do this. It says, ow, 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 you got to get it out of your nose. Ow. 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 And it is very common in Portuguese. There's a lot of things that end with it. And here's the thing about Brazilians. They do not give half credit. <laughs> you either get it right or they look at you like, and I'm saying, oh, come on, dude. I was in the ballpark. You know, give me credit. But they won't. But there is a big difference, for instance, woo, between this word and this word. The last word is the word foul. 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 Yeah, it's got to be nasally. If it's not nasally, you will get in trouble. 
Pow! 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 It's bread. It's bread. Yeah. Jesus said, I am the pow. She means that. The bread of life. Pow. If you don't nail it, if you don't <coughs> overstress that ow, ow, I mean, get it nasally, you're going to be in big trouble. Because this, you know, <laughs> you got to know, I mean, we're in church, but you you got to still know these things. This is the slang word for male genitalia. <laughs> Had one of our partners, a real life situation. He was going to go get bread for breakfast. He walked in and he asked for 12 dozy piles. And they just fell apart laughing at him. He came back to the hotel with bread. I said, man, where and how'd you get that? He said, I just went around there and asked them for it. He said, I guess they thought my accent was funny the way I asked for a pal. Everybody in the place was laughing at me. I said, dude, you don't know what you asked for. I said, what's in the bag? You <laughs> can get in trouble. So when I say you got to go overboard and making sure you see now, we as Americans would be lazy speakers, and we want to we want to kind of mush everything down into one sound. But in Brazil and in, in Portuguese, you can't do that. Bow, bow, bow. This is how. Pow, 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 pow. So big difference right. in those two. Pronounce where we fly into. S A. So it is so That's not the squiggly line, right? So. That is. So. so. Yes. So. <laughs> so. 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 Exactly right. So. So. <laughs> That is that is the masculine way to say this. Brother Randy, you That's preached in a city called Santa Elena. This would be St. Helen, and this is Saul St. Louis. So you see this is masculine and this is feminine. So Saint Louis is same as Bay Saint Louis. It's just written in the masculine way in Portuguese. Okay. Any questions before we do some uh, some linguistics? And I will give you some vocabulary so you can see the connection between Latin and uh, and Portuguese and English. And this will help you help you with your vocabulary abilities. Okay. Everybody good? Anything I can help you with, or is it something you got to sleep on? I miss Jay. Jay is Jota. Jota. J O T A is the way it's spelled, and it will make the J sound. Jota. Now, uh, Tony and uh, Randy, you guys, will, you guys remember from Greek studies and. I tell you, Greek has helped me more than anything in picking up this language because the gra grammatical structure is so similar. But in Greek, there's a whole other field, or in linguistics, called uh, etymology. Not entomology, which is the study of insects, but etymology, which is the study of, of word parts and uh, derivations and how they're put together. And that's just part of my geekness, I guess, as it, as it relates to linguistics. Even from studying the scripture in Greek or or doing Portuguese, I love to see how words come together. You remember that old guy on the 18? I love it when a plan comes together. Well, I love it when a word comes together. And let me let me get you started on this to show you how it, how it works. Uh, we have a word, and you'll see it in airports everywhere you go. Embark. Embark. Now again, we're coming from Latin to English. Uh, coming up from Latin and going into our family of languages, which is uh, Spanish, Portuguese, and English, and a few <clears> more. <throat> but let me show you how this how this comes about. Here's the root word right here, and the root word is the word bark. Now, in Portuguese, and as it comes to us through the language tree, uh, it would be uh, in Portuguese it would be baku. Remember. This one right here, anytime an R follows a vowel, it's going to kind of kind of H's. Give us the H sound. So we don't say barku. We say baku. Baku. We're going to put an H in it. So here we go. 
Uh, the root word is, is boat. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put a, a preposition prefix onto that word, which is uh, this, this word is the word that means in. And it just comes through the languages as E-M or E-N. So we have em baku, literally. Where, how this word derives. Now, stop and think about it. What it means, it means to leave on a journey. Now, let's go back four or five hundred years. Anytime somebody was traveling, especially across the ocean, how were they going to go? Sailing ship. So if a person was leaving, where was he literally? He was aim baku. That's right. So it ends up morphing as it comes through languages, and we get uh, in Portuguese, embarco. In English, we have embark. And you can see all that and it begins to make sense. Well, that makes perfect sense. Uh, there's another one in Portuguese you're going to hear all the time. It's a verb. And it's really not a real verb. It's a verb that's just kind of morphed into existence over the years. You'll hear it a lot. Embora. Embora. Uh, they have made this word to mean to leave. Quando in border? When are we going to leave? And the way it came down, this was a response to that question years ago. And as you break it apart etymologically, you have the prefix in, you have boa, which is the Word, feminine word for good, and then you have on the end, order, which is the word for time. So, you ask somebody when they were going, they would say, in boa order, I'm going to leave at a good time. So you can see how all this morphed now. And now you have the verb, in border. And they will ask you that, from the time you get there, they won't know when you're going to leave. Because they want you to stay forever. Uh, how long you're going to stay is basically what they're asking you. But there's just kind of the way some of this stuff morphs. Now, let me give you some vocabulary I think that's going to help you. And we'll make the connection to make you to uh, be able to catch some clues and rapidly ramp up your vocabulary. And after that, I'm going to give you some endings that you can just put on American words and you're going to expand your vocabulary immensely just by taking the English root and putting the Portuguese ending. And you're going to be light years ahead of where you are. Your vocabulary is going to be thousands times ahead of where it was when you walked in these doors tonight, I promise you. All right, here we go. Here's the Portuguese. We're going to do Portuguese on this side. And we're going to do, we'll do English on this side. All right? Here's a word. L-U-Z. Now, sometimes that Z does some struck. I mean, U will take on a nuance. It'll almost like it has an I right here, an unspoken I, Louise. They will say Louise. And that is the word for light. Louise. Could be used of this. Could be used of Jesus as the light of the world. <clears throat> And you can see how we get it, because let me give you the kind of the mediating word. I'm, I'm going to give you the middle word here in the middle as it comes to us through Latin. Say? Lux. Lux. Let's get one a little bit closer, maybe. Uh, e. Lumination. But yeah, uh, as you said, in it all, see that L U? Illumination. Louis. Light. So you can see we're not far off. I mean, we're in the same semantical field already. Let me give you another one. Here's the word morchi. Morchi. Remember that that R is going to take on more of an H. Morchi. Your T because it has an E after it's going to do the CH sound. Morchi. English. <coughs> that is the word death. Dr. Greg, how would we mediate that? More, more yeah, but let's give us an English word that will help us, I think. Mortuary. There you go, mortuary. 
Because what, what we want to do in this middle one here is kind of make a connection, uh, combining the Latin and the Portuguese and the English all together. Mortuary. So there's death. All right. Uh, here's another one. Somebody take a shot at pronouncing that. Corpo. 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 The body of Christ. So this is the word for body. Yeah. Yeah, you see that now. I told you. All I got to do is get y'all started and y'all take off on this stuff. Uh, all right, let me give you another one here. Some of you they may translate for you next time you go here. He All right, here is here's a word that's going to bring our cedilla and our chew into play. And we say this, cortisol. Cortisol. Dr. Gray, any idea? Cortisol. Got y'all. Well, let me give you this. Heart. Heart. Cardiac. Cardiac or coronary. coronary. Yeah, what did I put here? How, what was my bridge? Yeah, coronary. coronary. Is it A or O? Coronary. So you see now we got cortisol, cortisol, heart, and coronary. It's kind of that mediating link, English word that lets you see where that, how that comes together. Uh, here's another one. Order sound. Order sound. Order sound. Do you roll the R? Do you roll? Slight D. Order You don't sound. roll it, just more of a no. D. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they won't roll them. Just a very slight D. Order sound. Um, yeah, oratory or oration. You see that, that connection now? Uh, let me give you another one that has to do with the, our church language. Adora sound. Adora sound. Adoration. You got you got it right. You got the bridge right. It's the word worship. And who said it? Adoration. Okay. You're building your vocabulary. Don't erase it. All right, let me know what I can. Can I erase up the top? Can I do something up the top? Okay. Is this where you wanted the uh, uh, three to five index cards? No, nope, not yet. Okay. We'll over here. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're going to use those for for verb paradigms. Everybody ready? Is there going to be a test? Which one? <laughs> what do y'all need? <laughs> okay. Let's go again. We are building vocabulary. Portuguese. <laughs> Portuguese. The word is vento. Exactly right. Good pronunciation. In English, it is when. Now, you can see as in the middle because we use this word. Has to do with when, doesn't it? So you can see how the Latin has an effect on both sides of the family here. Okay? Yeah, the word for fan is... Eventually dull. Eventually dull. Which means a wind blower. Uh, literally. So. Same word as pretty good. Yeah, that's right. Eventually dull. That's right, bro. Uh, let's see. Uh, Cavallo. Cavallo. There you go. Say it again. Man, see, y'all are getting this. Horse. <coughs> and how would we, what would be the bridge word? Got it. 
Man, y'all are gonna smoke this stuff. <laughs> Here we go. This is double R, so how are we gonna say this? Terra. Terra. Teha. 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 What is it? Earth. Earth. You Maybe got it. Ground. Earth. Correct. Yeah, that's right. In the middle, we will have. How do you spell it? Terrestrial. Two R's. Terrestrial. Terrestrial. Exactly. Man, you guys are doing good. Let me give you another one. Here's, a, here's that diphthong again. C E U. Somebody? Sue. Sail. Sue. Sail. Sue. Sail. This is a big one in church because everybody wants to go to sail. Sail. Heaven. You got it. You got it. Celestial. By the way, they have this word in Portuguese when they're talking, when they're praying, they will sometimes say Pai, which is Father, Pai, Celestial. You see how they just accent it and say their letters the way they say them? So when you say Pai, Celestial, what have you said? Translate it for me. Heavenly Father. Exactly right. See, there, y'all, you guys are already translating. Man, this is going to be a slam dunk this weekend. Uh, here you go. Here's one of those. Uh, here's one of those. One of those uh, three Stooges deals. F O L H A. Folia. 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 Uh, it is the word. Leaf. Somebody said, "What's the bridge?" Foliage. Foliage. All right, let's see what else I got here. Uh, here we go. Loud. Forte. Well, if you were in, in French, that's exactly what right. it would be. I understand that. And by the way, French is another one of these Latin-based romance languages. And this is what linguists have not. Even more than that, I have a missionary friend that we do a little bit of work with in Burkina Faso, and that's all French. They despise missionaries from Portugal there because people who speak Portuguese can pick up French, boom, just like that. It's almost second nature because they're so close. And here you saw that, that commonality. In, in Portuguese, we would say porchi. Porchi. Yeah, and uh, what it means is strong. Now, in French, if someone's, or we say it in English, but we just bring it straight in from, from, from French. That's not my forte. What's that mean? It's not my strength. That's right. Uh, we can see the bridge here in any of these words. Uh, and just the word fort, or the word forti fortification, any, any of those, those all have to come from the same, or all in the same semantical family. Let me give you some more, because you guys are doing so good at this. You, you are... Increase in your vocabulary immensely. At some point, you want to give everybody a bathroom break. Absolutely, when you, brother. When you have a good chance. I, we're going to do that. Uh, I got about five more of these, and we're going to do just that. Right. Let me give you some more, because when we come back from our bathroom break, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Let me give you a few. Uh, here we go. Nabil. You see, both of these letters make their sound, or all three of them in this word. Now, these. English, what would it be? Ship. Ship. There you go. Navigation, or, or even smaller. Yeah, let's just let's just do navy. Uh, <laughs> Here, here's a verb that's going, to, that's going to be strong in your vocabulary because it's used a million times. Uh, we're just going to give you the basic meaning here as we make this connection. It's the word fall debt. Fall debt. And it does. It does. And it, uh, we, will, we will translate it as can, I can. Or we can translate it, if it's a noun, it would be power. Yeah, you, you said right, it would be able. 
Uh, but let's just focus on full debt and power. And in the middle, I think, would be this word here, full potential. Ah, here's a good one. Here's another verb. Somebody pronounce it for me. Say it again, Tony. Let. 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 Any idea of the meaning? Let. Let. To read. Let. Now, there's a word in the middle that we use. <clears throat> If the student gives you something and it's not legible, what's that mean? Can you read it? So there's your, there's your middle. Uh, I think that's enough. We'll continue this, but now, aren't you seeing a connection? And aren't you seeing some things come together? When you come back after break, I'm going to give you some endings, Portuguese endings, that you can put on for... for uh, Adverbs and for adjectives and, and for some nouns. And all you have to do is take the English word, English root word, put on their ending, and you've got it. And then you're going to expand your vocabulary by another couple thousand words just like that. So let's take a break for about 10 to 15 minutes, and we'll come back and hit it again. We'll be done here in, in the vicinity of nine. And tomorrow morning, we really going to get to the heart of Portuguese, which is the verb. By that clock. I think the key to, to any language is the verb. If you can grab the verb, you've got it in a headlock. It's yours. So let me give you now some, some, some ways that you can make your Portuguese vocabulary expand exponentially. And this is some of those things that nobody taught me. So when Heather and I teach Portuguese, we teach what we call missionary Portuguese, which means we want to get you on a fast track to being able to communicate, and we want to teach you how they talk on the street, because as you know, formal English is a lot different than what we use on the street, uh, and same way in, in Portuguese. Uh, one thing about seminary, Especially the higher you get in education, man, your language has got to be so formal. Uh, it's got to be politically correct. It's got to be uh, gender specific. It's got to be all those types of things. So you're writing formally, but then you go in the homiletics class and they teach how to preach and they want you to talk like you're talking on the street. They don't want you to talk formally because it don't communicate. And it's that way with Portuguese. We want you to communicate and talk the way they talk on the street. So, we're about to expand your vocabulary by giving you some, giving you some, uh, some, some keys and some tricks. If you grab these, I promise you, your vocabulary can go through the roof without ever having to open a dictionary or a lexicon. Now, let's start with this, with this uh, formation of letters here. C Sevilla with an A, Q, O. Just, just the sound itself would be sound, sound. And it is an ending that's put on a ton of words in Portuguese. Let me give you one. Somebody will take a shot at pronunciation? Hesepsal. Hesepsal. All right, what is that word? Reception. Here's the key. Anytime you have this on the end of a word, you can replace it with T-I-O-N, put it on the root, and look what you've got. Isn't that a neat trick? None of my Portuguese teachers have been kind enough to give me some of the keys that I've given you. So, again, this is going to ramp your vocabulary way up. You can take just about any T-I-O-N word, take the root off of it, put this on it, pronounce it like they do, and you just package the vocabulary word. For instance, 
When I study Portuguese, sometimes I have The only thing you'd say frustração. Frustração. That's right. How are you saying that C A O? I like that. Sal. 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 S O A. Sal. Sal. Yes. Sal. Sal. You got to get that nasally N sound at the end of it. Ow. Ow. That's right. Ow. Frustração. Now, somebody, somebody give me a P-I-O-N word. Ah, uh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Somebody, somebody tell me how to take this word that we use a lot in church and make it Portuguese. Salvação. 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 All right. Who I got one? About aggravation. <laughs> Don't worry. Stop. I've never heard it used in Portuguese. <laughs> Give me another one. Intention. What? Intention. Intention. Yeah, it, it'll work. The problem is it has a different meaning. But it does work. In Where's TJ? Yeah. TJ wants to know constipation. Yeah. That's not in my vocabulary. I had that opportunity to use that in preaching or teaching, but it would probably work. Here's one. Here's a good safe one. How about comparison? Comparison? I win. Yeah, comparison. In Portuguese, it is comparação. What about completion? Completion. Completion. Translation. Somebody else. What you said that tension translated differently. So the word, if you if you had used that, the tension style, how would it what it would it have been? Um, they use they use a word. The word is, we would have pretension, but this is pretende. Uh, it doesn't mean to act or to pretend to be something, but it means that I am intending to do it. So they would just use a different word. Uh, intensão is a word in Portuguese, but normally they go a different direction with it. Uh, that's where when you're translating, if you translate literally, sometimes you get into some foggy areas. You just need to know what their normal vocabulary is. And this is one of those words that for us that it kind of backs up and goes the opposite direction on us, but you just got some of those that just got to know that don't follow the rule. Does anybody else have another I-O-N word that you want to throw out? Distraction. <laughs> How about revelation? Crucifixion. Yeah. Uh, That's a good one. Yeah. Crucifixal. Hevelasal. Both of those. Remember, just uh, you, you can put that ending on it, but you got to pronounce it as if you were a Brazilian. So, hevelasal. This one. Wait a minute, pronounce it. Okay. Okay, here we go. Hevelasal. Hevelasal. Crucifixal. So you are pronouncing the R. Yes, the same one. 
And when, it, when, it, when it's followed by, uh, or when it comes after a consonant, if, it was, if this was a vowel, then it would take more of the H. When it has a vowel in front of it, but it has a consonant in it, you will pronounce it. So this will be crucifixal. Cruci, and that's why the C is double. The, the first C will take on the K, crucifix, and then the last one, sal. Uh, sanchi, sanchi, fi, sanchi. fi, fi, chow. Hang on. <laughs> sanchi, fi, fi. ka, sal. Now, sanctification. Sanchi, fi, ka, sal. Let's go ahead and do the other one. Jushi Fikasal. Jushi Fikasal. Let's do the last one. Glory Fikasal. You see, this time, Greg, the, the R does more of the H. Glor, Glor, Glory Fikasal. That is a trick. Don't tell anybody that you were taught that by me because all Portuguese teachers like to keep that thing under wraps for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> now let me give you another, another one that's going to do the same thing in expanding your vocabulary. What did you say? You got it, brother. Let's do that one. We are taking English roots and making Portuguese words out of them. Here is the ending. D-A-G-E. Now, if you were down south in uh, São Paulo or Porto Alegre, somewhere like that, they would say Dadi. Sounds very strange to our ears because we're up in Montanhão and Redneck country. <coughs> and up there they say Dadi. Dadi. Now, Daji is equal in English to I or T-Y. Yeah, just, just T-Y. Uh, most of them do have the I. For example, what is this word right here? You got it. City. Now, you can do that with uh, with most all T-Y words, and that's what you'll end up with. For example, let's take, uh, let's shift sides here. Velocity. Let's make that thing Portuguese. You got it, brother. Velocidade. Velocidade. And it means just that. If you hear a Brazilian say that someone was traveling at alto or alto velocidade, it means he was traveling at high speed. All right. Uh, who? No. Responsibility. Say it again. Responsibility. All right, now, I want y'all to give me That's a long word, but you know what? The long words are easier to say than the short ones. Short ones give me this. Those long ones, and the Brazilians laugh at me. They say, Pastor, you can say words that have seven syllables, but the one syllables kill you. So yeah, that's right. They do. I just laugh. So, so give me the Brazilian pronunciation of this. And y'all got it. Responsibilidade. Nós temos um grande responsibilidade de pregar. We have a great responsibility to preach. Okay, somebody give me another one. Because this works. It works. Capacity. Capacity. Let's translate it. Capacidade. 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 Capacid
Capacidade. Capacidade. All right. Uh, here's one. Here's one that's uh, this popular. That's the one I was gonna give, brother. It's a big one in uh, Brazil. <coughs> Somebody want to help me? Very rarely in Portuguese do they double the consonants. <coughs> so it would just be one in in Portuguese. But, you know, when you're speaking it, they can't check your spelling. Comunidade. Now, here's what you'll hear Ariotan say a lot of times. Comunidade quilombola. What did he just say? Exactly right. Comunidade quilombola. A, a quilom. A community of quilombolas. That's exactly what he's saying. Uh, let me give you another one. It's going to be... A little bit off the chart, but you need this one. Uh, and you can see again the Latin connection in this. Faithfulness. Faithfulness would translate like this. Now, I, I tell you, you can see, this is the way it's commonly done, but we would, uh, if we held to the rule, to the strict uh, rule, we would say it like this. What's that word? Fidelity. Fidelity. Faithfulness. They're the same thing, aren't they? Yes. In English, we just opt for faithfulness. So over here, the faithfulness of God. A fidelidade de Deus. So you got fidelidade. Now, every time you hear them say it, because you'll hear all the time that, that uh -huh. daji oh, ending. Yes. And that's all it is. It's a T-Y word. It's a T-Y word. So I'm telling you, your ear and your tongue are going to thank you profusely for learning this little trick next time you get to Brazil. Now, again, that applies almost across the board. Now, as always, you're going to find you're just going to be places where it don't. They about the Trinity. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you think Trinity would die? <laughs> See, if we held to the strict rule, we would think that. But for some reason, they just do this, Brian. Trin daji. They drop a syllable on us for some reason. But trin daji. When you hear trin daji, that's the trinity. Upai. Father. Ufiyu. Ah, here you go. Be you. Be you. Son. E. O. The masculine article. We'll get to masculine feminine tomorrow. Upai. Upi you. E is the word and. E. U. Espiritu Santo. In, in Portuguese, they will not start an English, you know, a lot of our words that, that start with SP, they'll always put an E on it. For instance, sports. Plural, esportes. They just have a, an aversion to start the word with SP. So just about all SP words will, will turn out this way. Now let me get, go ahead. That's why when Steve but, um, uh, oh. There you go. Steve. That's exactly Estevie. right. They won't say ST. Right. They, they put an E up there. And that's, I don't know I why. Do that now. It's one of the things. Now, let me give you another trick. Again, you are expanding your vocabulary immensely. What I want you to do on your notes is if you'll just write, have this pattern written down on a page, you can just brainstorm IT words and almost translate them without the use of a dictionary or anything else. I'm going to show you tomorrow some dictionaries and some tools and resources. Uh, there's another ending that is huge in Brazil. There's about two or three more, and then we're done. And it's this word, this, this ending right here. Menchi. Menchi is equivalent to 
When mention is on the end of a word in Portuguese, you know it's an adverb. It's an adverb. Remember, I mean, that's an easy rule in English. L-Y, adverb. Mention, adverb. For example, let me give you one that, uh, this word right here, rapid. In Portuguese, the, the, it, it would be specific gender, whether you're talking about some uh, masculine or, or feminine subject. So let's just say we had something that's masculine. If it is quick, if it's an adjective, we would say hapido, 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 hapido. Now, if it is something that we need done quickly, hapido mention. You'll hear you're, you'll hear a Brazilian say hapido mean, hapido mention, or hapichinho means quick. Of course, I don't know why they say that because nothing's ever passed in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, theoretically, <laughs> the proposition <laughs> does exist that something could be quick, but it's not. So are you saying that word right there would, in English could be translated rapidly? It would rapidly in English, yeah. In Portuguese, we would probably say quickly. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's another vocabulary word for you. What about commonly? <laughs> Is commonly common? Uh, I've never heard that. Give me another one. Ironically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, see, they don't have the same root. Let, let me give you some. Let me get you started on some that, that do have the same root. Uh, immediately. Immediately. Heather gets me on this one every time. Because we have an E right here, I want to say immediately, like we do in English, but it's not. It's immediately, immediately, and you've got immediately. Um, so let me give you another one. Correctly, he spoke Portuguese correctly. Sorry. <laughs> My conscience spoke. Uh, in Portuguese, co he ta mechi. Let me give you another one. Certainly. Anybody want to try? Sentamente, sentamente, the root word right here, the root word, seto, means right. You'll hear him say, ta seto, ta seto, ta seto, it is right, it is right. Exactly. Somebody want to take a stab? Exatamente. Exactly. I heard you using that word over and over in the Quilombo that night. We used a proclaimer, and they would make a comment. And yes. You would always say, exactly. Yeah. Exactamente. 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 There, there's another way they commonly say this. This is kind of the, the formal way to say certainly, but this is the way that's said most of the time on the street. Col, se, teza. One of those rare uses of the Z. Con certeza. If somebody says to you, uh, do you like it here in Brazil? You would say, con certeza. That means certainly I like it here. Literally, con is with. And here's that, that rule we learned. It's a final M, but it's pronounced like an N. Con with certainty. Exactly right. With certainty. What about absolutely? Yes. Absolutamente. Absolutamente. Absolutely. And sometimes when you have a B there uh, in that second, they would say absolutamente. The B kind of says its name, absolutamente. And you'll pick that up sometimes with some others. Now, there's two more of these I'm going to give you and we're going to the house. And I tell you guys, if you'll put this under your pillow and sleep on it, <laughs> then your vocabulary. <laughs> yeah, you'll wake up in the morning and you'll want uh, you'll want some. Yeah, that's what's uh, here 
is an accent that, that we didn't talk about, but here's another accent mark. A V E L I V E L R E. I will evil. This would be able, and this would be. So when we have uh, English words that end in A, B, L, E, we're going to substitute the root word. We're going to knock the ending off, and we're going to take the root and put this on it. For instance, was your hotel comfortable? <coughs> <laughs> Comfortable. We're going to put that baby in Portuguese. Comfort. And the only thing is that M is going to go to N. Comforta. There's your accent. Comfortável. Comfortável. Let's go over here to the I, I side. With God, all things are possible. Com Deus, todas as coisas são possível. So we're going to go P O S S E accent mark possível. Now, the only problem is the verse that I quoted, this would have to be plural. Everything in Portuguese has to agree in gender and in number and in all of those type things. We'll get to that tomorrow. But this would simply translate this, uh, if it's plural, if it's more than one, it's eves. So we would have posives. <coughs> and the same thing up here, posives. Now, so time out. Yes, sir. Now, that does not change the gender, but it it changes the number. Yes, that, that's your plural. Yes, exactly. It's exactly right. Great observation. Somebody want to give me an able word, an able and an able able word, and we'll close this thing down. You gonna go home, put this under your pillow, sleep on it. We're gonna come back more and do bird paradigms. How about enable? Uh, available. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to say that. Uh, they would. They would probably do that. They probably use the word capacity and say uh, capacitado. So that would be, be the way that one would translate. Or they would say he has the ability. Abilidade. Abilidade. Okay. There's some there's some ways, some some words are they have them, but that you know they don't normally use them that way. Yeah, somebody else had one. I heard somebody say miserable. Uh, yeah. Now say that for us, Pastor Randy. <laughs> yeah, pastel handy. Miserable. Miserable. See when I ask you, <laughs> there, you want to stress that baby. Miserable. E Miser before the R, so we get a little H. Miserable. Somebody said resistible, or the Brazilians would say irresistible. Simply irresistible. All right. Huh? <laughs> hey, we got a new song for you to sing at the school next time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got to admit, I've never hit one in my life, but I hit that one. Yeah, you know. that one. <laughs> when you stand yeah. up in front of 400 students and you sing, this girl is on fire. <laughs> in Portuguese. <laughs> oh, yeah. It would be irresistible. You see, you just take the I-B-L-E off, 
and you put I with your accent V E L and you've got it. Uh, uh, one more and we're done. Comparable. Just a minute, uh, Heather, and tell me what you what you're saying. Is a uh, shout to the Lord. No, no, uh, that one has that one, but it's a Amarville. Amarville. Yeah. See, we don't, uh, the word in Portuguese for love is amor. 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 Okay. Amor. amor. Got an H on the end of it. What's amor. the Latin root? You tell me. Amor. Amor. A-M-O. Okay. Amor. That's it. Got to be. There yeah. are a few things I do remember from Latin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ambrose. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the only person I've ever heard use that is Ray Stevens in one of his songs. <laughs> <laughs> now let's let's do this. Something that was Ray Stevens and Ray Stevens. Well, yeah, there yeah, you go. Yeah, you never knew Portuguese. I, so I'm halfway Portuguese too. I'm Totalmente amável, totalmente digno, és maravilhoso para mim. What is the name of that song? Here I am to worship. Here I am to worship. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Amável. Lovable or lovely. And now, you probably heard just in me singing that, you heard a lot of words that now you can put together. Totalmente. What is totalmente? Totally. Totalmente amável. Totalmente digno. That's it. That's the Portuguese word for digno. Is worthy. Ele é digno de nosso louvor. Ou nossa adoração. He is worthy of our worship. Worship. Okay. Comparable and we're done. I promise you we're out of here. Comparable. Somebody give it to me. Comparable. Comparable. Now, I want y'all to say that one because we're going to practice talking all over ourselves because you got to hit every one of those syllables and you got to hear them right. We, we would just tail it off in English. Comparable. But that, in Portuguese, you can't do that. Comparable. Say it with me. Comparable. It's almost like you've got to overstress each syllable to get it right. And then when you do that, you're speaking good Portuguese. Comparable. Now, guys, listen to me. You are light years ahead of where you were when you walked in here at 7, seven o'clock tonight. Your vocabulary is tons ahead of where it was. Now, tomorrow morning, Pastor Randy, what time we have breakfast? 8.30. 8.30. We're going to start with our 3 by 5 note cards on verb paradigms. If you can get the verb, you got this language in the, what's that thing on on uh, UFC, the bare neck and choke? Rear Oh, rear neck and choke. 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 You got her in a headlock, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I appreciate your willingness to do this. It says something about you and your commitment to the Lord and your commitment to get the gospel around the world, even if it means, hey, the gospel of Mark said, and these signs shall follow them who believe. They shall speak in what? New tongues. That may not be so charismatic as we think. It may mean speaking in Portuguese. So we'll pray that God give us the tongue of Portuguese and we'll get her done. Look there. We already had Larry the Cable Guy. We've had the three students. We've had Ray Stevens. Who else we brought to the platform of Portuguese tonight? Just about everybody we can think of. So let's, uh, let's pray.